Um, I want to welcome everyone and uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Heather Diaz and I'm an information services librarian at Ford's Library. Um, although we are gathering virtually today, um, I want to recognize that the library stands on Nonatuck land and we also acknowledge our neighboring indigenous nations, the Nipmuc and Wampanoag to the east, the Mohegan and Pequot to the south, the Mohican to the west, and the Abenaki to the north. We pay our respects to indigenous elders past and present of these communities and any others who may be here today. Um, this is and always will be indigenous land. Uh, we're also grateful to the scholarship of historian Lisa Brooks, as well as Bixie Utzler and Ian Miller, upon whose research this land acknowledgement draws. Um, for those of y'all in attendance tonight, um, you can use the chat to post questions or comments as we go along. Um, I'll be monitoring the chat. So if you're having technical problems, you can also use the chat to send me a message and I'll do my best to help you. Um, one final note, well, two final notes actually, before I hand things over to Carolyn. Um, we are recording this Zoom meeting um, and I, assuming everything runs correctly, I'll be able to post it on the Forbes YouTube page afterwards and Carolyn will be able to share the link um, as well. And I just also wanna mention that um, you have the option to turn on closed captioning for this meeting, if that's useful or interesting to you. Um, it's the option is, it may be under the more button down by your leave meeting button at the, at the bottom where all your Zoom control options are and Zoom calls closed captioning live transcript. Um, so if you can't figure it out and you want help, um, just find me in the chat and I will do my best to help you turn it on. Um, so with that, I'd like to hand things over to Carolyn. And I'm Carolyn Oppenheim and I am the coordinator of the Francis Crow film series, but I want to say something about technical problems. I think there is one because um, we only have 24 participants. We know that 73 people and a number of people have said in the chat that it was hard to figure out how to get on. So I'm wondering if there's a bunch of people somewhere. Um, it doesn't make sense that there are only 24 people when 73. I feel like, I don't know what the situation is. And I wonder if there's some way to troubleshoot it. Um, I can yeah, update. Another person just said technical difficulty. Yeah, if, if we wanna uh, go ahead and get started, um, I can add uh, the direct Zoom link to the library's calendar page into the Facebook event. Um, but will but people I, know to go there? I don't think we can reach them if otherwise. So I- Well, I'd like to ask people a question. Um, we had said that when you got on the film, you just stay and there's a five minute pause and then the Q&A starts. Um, so I don't understand why people had trouble getting onto the Q&A, it wasn't a separate link. Oh, now somebody else has entered the waiting room. I could admit them. Um, Carolyn, I, I do think we should just go ahead and begin um, for yeah. the sake of time. Okay, uh, okay. All right, if I, if I see, uh, I'll admit, okay. So, um, briefly, the Francis Crow film series is named for Francis Crow, who was for many, many years, um, I could spend the whole time talking about Francis, but she began this film series and she was a very well-known activist on many social justice subjects, living in Northampton, but also with a national reputation. But her deep belief was that film was the most important tool to bring subjects alive to people to engage conversation and make social change. So we have kept her name in the film uh, series. Now, this wonderful film, we have some 
really preeminent people who made it. First is director producer, Hemel Trivedi. She is a Mumbai and New York based documentary filmmaker whose editing work has won an Academy Award, three Emmys and seven Emmy Award nominations. Her most recent feature was called Among the Believers and it premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival. I'm not gonna go on and on because you can Google okay. her and you can see her name here and you can Google her and um, find it. Her colleague and co-director and producer, director of photography is Jonah Markowitz. He's a photojournalist and a filmmaker. Um, you may have seen an amazing piece that he did in the New York Times. You know, they do multimedia. It was um, the, one of the larger, largest visual pieces during the COVID-19 pandemic. It was called Transit Workers Were New York City's Pandemic Lifeline. He also writes for uh, and does photography for publications like the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, you name it, he's done it. Um, so that's who we have here who put this film together and worked for three years on it. Um, I think we're really honored to have been able to get this film. And um, as long as she's here, I will mention the producer who brought this film to me, who's just a genius at getting these kinds of films, is Marga Varea of Twin Seas Media, based in Cambridge. And you can see her. Um, she is crackerjack at finding these kinds of pathbreaking films. I'm sure we'll get more of her films. So um, we've all seen the film, and um, I don't see any other than complaining about the difficulty of getting on, <laughs> I am hoping we will have um, some comments or questions. Put them in the chat, as Heather said, and we'll read them. And uh, we, we thought we were gonna have too many people to call on people. I suppose if it doesn't get too big, we can call on people now if somebody wants to put it in the chat they wanna be called on. Anybody have anything they want to comment about the film or ask a question of the filmmakers and their work? Oh, Linda Wallach, what is the date this movie was made? One of you want to take that up? Well, we finished it right before uh, the elections. Uh, I think it was two weeks before the elections that we finished it. But you were working on it for three years. Yes. So we started working on it right after Donald Trump was elected president, which is, uh, I think we must have started in the summer of 2017. And then we, you know, 2017 is when we started our research. And then 18 and 19 is when we did most of our work. And uh, 2020 is when uh, we released it. Because I, I noticed a lot of people not wearing masks. That's why I was <laughs> yeah. curious. Yeah, it's, it's already dated. <clears throat> it's already dated. <laughs> <laughs> so Maureen Flannery says, can you summarize the results for the 2020 election in Lehigh Valley? Well, I think Lehigh Valley overall went uh, to Biden, but it was a big it was until the very last moment that it was up for a toss. It was like up for grabs and it was quite close. I think Northampton, did Northampton County go for Biden or did it, what happened there, John? I think it, it I went for- I, I believe so. Um, I mean, we didn't very, obviously, we finished filming two weeks before the 2020 election. So we, we didn't follow 2020 as closely as- <laughs> as the 2018 midterms. Uh, but Susan Wilde won her reelection campaign uh, yeah. in 2020. Pretty handily, I think she was bullied by uh, the anti-Trump sentiment. And I'm, and I'm, I'm sure that uh, Biden won in, in Lehigh. I don't know whether he won in Northampton County. I think it was a very narrow victory in Northampton. I think Northampton, there was a recount and it was very, very narrow. So Biden had law, uh, sorry. Uh, Hillary had lost in Northampton. So Biden, right. Biden gained that seat. 
Kelton yep. Pro, Pro asks, oh, I'm sorry, Jonah, go on. It, I was just going to say that it, it was a narrow flip to Biden uh, in Northampton County, which is the which is the true bellwether county, which is the, the, the reason that it brought us there, right? Was it, it flipped yeah. to Trump in 2016. Yeah. And so there was a lot of analysis around that time, kind of spot news coverage analysis around um, around why that why that county flipped to Trump and uh, why it was a bellwether county. Um, Calthor Crow wants to know, she's wondering what people thought about the fact that what that the Tea Party guy thought that Trump would bring positive change. Well, I think to each their own, you know, I think members of the Tea Party very, very positively believed that, very strongly believed that Trump is going to be their savior. And, you know, it was, Trump was somebody's nightmare and somebody's uh, messiah. I think that's how he is. He's a polarizing figure. And I think that's how most of these cult figures work is they're polarizing to, and they evoke extreme sentiments in different groups of people, depending on whom you're speaking to. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess uh, I'm wondering whether the, the question means whether he did in fact bring, bring positive change over the four years that he was there or, uh, yeah, I'm a little, I don't, don't really quite understand the question. Do uh, you People didn't Peter, lose. Can you unmute Kalfa? Kalfa Crow? No, I wasn't thinking he brought about any positive changes. <laughs> and after four years of him bringing about mostly negative changes, yeah. how did, you know, I'm just wondering what it was that that spoke to the, I've forgotten the name of the Tea Party guy, but what what did he do that spoke to him that made him feel like this is these have been positive changes over these last four years and we've got to get him back again? Uh, well, I mean, I think does the, my question make sense now? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the the reasons that people voted for Trump in 2016 would would be very similar reasons to why they'd vote for him in 2020. Primarily, a cultural alliance. Um, you know, a a uh, they they had faith that Trump would um, would would see the rural uh, rural particularly white working class that um, that hasn't gotten a fair shake over the past you know fifty years uh, whose 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 kids are not uh, doing as well as their parents um, and that that is not necessarily you know that's 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 due to the fact that you know a lot of the jobs have moved to the cities, and, and it's not it's not something that Trump was ever fully prepared to fix, nor could he ever fix in four years. Uh, but it was that cultural attachment that people felt that people still felt in 2020, uh, and that's the cultural attachment that gave um, gave him the leeway uh, to be able to say, "Hey, I can't undo everything in four years. I know everything's not perfect in my it, it, after four years, but you know, I I think I I think." I did a good job for you guys and people generally believe that I don't think he I don't think he lost very many supporters over the course of four years I think there were more motivated people in 2020 to get him out as compared to 2016 um that's my that's my take and I, I think uh, I think I think I think uh, Tom Carroll did mention that black lives matter I mean that he has seen a surge in a membership of Tea Party following the Black Lives Matter protests. I mean, didn't he say that, Jonah? Yeah, I mean, it's the same, it's the same sort of cultural, yeah. um, you know, racial progress backlash that we've seen in this nation, I mean, countless times, right, so. So th I think you've answered one of the questions, which is, did you see any shift in attitudes or belief during the three years of your filming? I, I, I certainly saw a, after 2016, when the, the Democratic Party moved a little bit further to the left, I saw a lot more rhetoric around socialism, a lot more rhetoric around, uh, uh, around communism coming from, from the right. I think that, that 
became a central tenant to uh, to voting for Trump was we can't let this country go go that way. Um, and so I didn't see that when we first showed up in 2017, I didn't see that as much. Um, and I don't, I don't remember socialism being a huge part of the 2016 election, uh, yeah. but with the rise of AOC and the right and the sort of steadily pushing a little bit further to the left. Uh, I saw that as a, as I saw that coming up more and more. That was my sense that it got more and more and more partisan over the last four years. Yeah. But I'm still constantly surprised by people I know. I've, I've got uh, someone who used to be a good friend and we're still talking to each other. Um, <laughs> but she considers herself a Christian. She's got a good head on her shoulders, the whole bit. And she's a, totally a Trump supporter. And I can't fathom how she can reconcile that with her own sense of morality and ethics. Mm. Um, and I've got, you know, two other people that I, one of them very local, I do his books and have been doing his books for about 15 years now. And he's a good business person. Um, and he generally has a good head on his shoulders. Um, he considers me extremely pragmatic, mm. but he is a Trump supporter because he thought Trump was a good businessman. Yeah. And I, I'm just, how can you be in business and think Trump was a good businessman? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> We have another question here. Um, did people talk at all about unions? Um, this person says um, she didn't hear any reference to it. And what about what happened with the deindustrialization of the area? Um, yeah, I think I. I mean, I, I mean, there there are. I don't think that we didn't hear much about unions, honestly. But what we did hear is, you know, one thing that one thing that was happening is there was a lot of energy on the left it was like almost like this diverse when we when we started going in 2017 and 18 this was before aoc was elected this was before progressives kind of got some power in government uh, we saw a lot of sporadic uh, assorted forces or uh, grassroots movements kind of coming up from the from the left and they they didn't know what to do with the uh, with their energy but they were all kind of trying to organize themselves to figure out what can we do to influence the next election and i think a lot of those forces probably were the reason why you know biden got elected and probably the reason why there was you know we got uh, the i mean susan wilde got elected so we saw that, which uh, which a lot of people said that this was something that had not happened since Obama. Uh, unfortunately, I think a lot of that a lot of that energy didn't filter down to unions um, no. because it was not heavily discussed. Uh, and you know, Bethlehem is Bethlehem is a steel town, very traditionally very strong union. I mean, the the steel workers union traditionally been one of the stronger unions in the country, um, and and obviously those steel jobs aren't there anymore, but there wasn't, there wasn't, that's not where the energy lies on the left right now. I mean, I think there's much more, uh, much more in the way of social justice and economic justice through legislation, through $15 raise, minimum wage, yeah. that kind of stuff, than there is in, in trying to organize um, unions. And I think that's a testament to uh, a little bit of cultural change, uh, but also how hard companies have fought the tooth and nail uh, to to eliminate unions, to bust unions, and to not make them culturally relevant. When I watched, when I looked at the rusting steel, yeah, you know, I I grew up with much of my childhood in Pittsburgh, and it was the same thing when. They talked about um, when this man said back in the day, you know, a steel worker could afford, you know, a little house and everybody had a summer place. Where did he say? In the Poconos or someplace on in the Jersey way. Shore. Jersey Shore. Jersey Shore. And I remember that as a child, um, the steel worker families in my neighborhood, they carried their lunch buckets to work. Mm -hmm. uh, 
they had little cottages up on Lake Erie and um, the families lived in little bungalow houses in the neighborhood. But, um, you know, I, I think, I feel like I'm, I'm putting my own opinion in here. I know I'm a facilitator. I feel like NAFTA killed that culture because once the North American free trade, you know, we began buying steel from yeah. abroad and um, they didn't want to pay American labor for steel, you know, and that was under Clinton. Yeah. Yep. And I think that's why that's why they felt abandoned, you know, that's why the solidly democratic place went to Trump because Trump showed them, gave them a promise which he never kept or never intended to keep, but he at least, I mean, there, I think that plight was real, I feel. Yeah. That anger was real. It was an angry, it was out of anger. Right. And, they, and, they, and people felt that they had been left behind by both parties, which- Both which, parties, yeah. Which, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not here to talk about which parties left people more behind, but the fact of the matter is that we haven't had one Solid. We haven't had one administration over the course of the last thirty or forty years while the wealth gap has increased tremendously. You've had both. You've had both yeah. parties in power. Yeah. Um, and sure, one. You know, we can. We all. One party is doing better than the other. But the fact of the matter is, some of the blame lays at the feet of both parties. And with and respect to some of this. In the scenes you showed of Ed and Tom together, they agreed on that. And I would yeah. like Jeff Wineglass. Can you unmute yourself and ask your own question, please? Is that possible? Maybe. Yeah, there you go. Hi, Kai. Hi, Jeff. Hi. Um, so I was, uh, I'll, I'll turn my video on for a minute here too. Sure. We're, a couple things going on, but uh, I was curious about, um, first of all, I had the names wrong. It's Tom and Greg, is that right? Those were the yes. two Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was curious about how much time they spent together and, and, um, and also, really interested in what you saw that they did find common ground on. You know, we heard or, or the film presented a sense of common ground around money and politics. And then in their last conversation, they talked about criminal justice reform. But I wonder if there were more things that you sensed that they were finding common ground around. Um, I, I mean, I think the whole entire meeting was about two hours, I would say. And these are the two areas, and I, I don't think they touched upon other areas, but this is a conversation that we would like to keep on going if possible. I think I also think that they uh, they found common ground in feeling like the part, both of the establishments of both parties didn't really want to hear what they had to say, mm -hmm. didn't, didn't really want to give them a seat at the table. Uh, expected their votes to get their people through, but then right afterwards you can sit down and shut up, and we don't need we don't need your input anymore. Uh, and that's that's something that both of them felt pretty strongly. Um, mm -hmm. Now, you know, the point is the point is not the point that we're trying to make is not that all of a sudden the far left and far right have a million things in common, uh, but in, but instead exactly. the, instead we're we're trying to show that these two men who are, you know, polar opposites in a lot of ways and still are still capable of sitting and having reasonable conversations and finding things that they can, they both can agree on. Um, what, albeit somewhat limited in terms of policy things, but they still can have a, can have a conversation. Uh, and they can still talk about where the, the pain of the people who they represent, where that pain is coming from. Because if you look at the pain of the people on the far left in Greg's constituency in urban Allentown. Uh, if you look at that pain and you look at the root of the pain coming from a lot of Trump voters, mainly in, in, in rural and suburban areas, the, it's, it's, it's coming from, it's, some of it is coming from a similar place. And that's an, that's an economic place. That's a disp economic disparity, lack of, lack of opportunity. Um, you know, not being able to go to college without without coming away with huge loans, like th those kind of things, and those those are they may have different ways of, of solving them, but at least we can if we can if we can get to the pain, if we can get to the you know the third why of why these why these feelings are out there, then at least then we have a real real place to have a conversation, uh, and it's not it's not based on you know 140 character tweets or CNN versus Fox News yeah. headlines. 
because that never gets us anywhere. Um, and so I think they both have, they both, obviously they market themselves differently, but they both have that in common that they, that they, uh, that they are, they are responding to real pain in their constituencies and that they're trying to have, uh, and that they're willing to have a respectful conversation about, about maybe unconventional ways to, to get to that pain. I think, I think there's one more thing that they both agreed on. And I don't know if it made into the film. I think we allure, we allured it, allure to it and which is, that the establishment is the one that's pitting the groups against each other. And, you know, the, because the establishment, it's an establishment's best interest to see us divided. So then we keep fighting each other. We are like suspicious of each other. And while they, you know, while they do whatever they need to do in order to fill their pockets. So um, I think that's something that they both agreed on. And, uh, Right. And, and and we are actually we both you know we were applying for uh, awards and you know we needed letters of support and we got letter of support from Tom Carroll and Greg Edwards both endorsing our film and the power of our film to drive con uh, conversations and they both said that both like you know Tom Carroll admired the fact that Greg Edwards believes in his family and his community and is doing is doing work for the community and family and Edwards believes that Tom Carroll is committed towards his community and family and I think that's one thing that they have in common as well. Very helpful thank you very much. Yeah. Sure. I think one other small note just to piggyback off what, what Hamel just said is that it's true that the establishment uh, parties use sort of use headlines and use things to 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 whip up more fear and more um uh you know like pro like they 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 create they manage problems rather than actually solving them right because if you solve a problem then you're then you're voted out of office because the problem exactly. is, your issue <laughs> yeah. isn't there anymore right um so so that's that's i think another thing that they have in common is that they're trying to have at least when when they sat down together, they're trying to. They have the ability, and they were trying to have a conversation that was deeper than than a than a headline, basically. Oh, and they also they also had one more thing in common, which is the importance of voter participation, and importance of participation of people at the grassroots, and also trying to settle our differences or our scores on the ballot box and not outside. Mm -hmm. So they both believed in the merit of democracy, which I think was admirable, <laughs> given where we are right now in our country. But yeah, right. but, but there's on. one important caveat, which is that we didn't film in the aftermath of Trump's victory. So we don't know what the Tea Party was up to and how and how and how they were how they viewed his election loss uh, in our democracy in this time. So that's a, that's, that's a caveat. Right, because Tom did imply that if they didn't win, there could be other problems, right? So yeah, he did. He did imply. I mean, that, but that's also a realistic assessment of of how whipped up people are. Um, yeah. And yeah, I mean, you know, yeah. So there's another question that maybe it's a good time to ask it. Was there? Wait, I while you were filming. Mm. Was was there any? Um, did you see anything of militias or QAnon? I didn't see it. Wait, anything of of what or Q Q or what? QAnon crowd or any militias? Oh, militia. Oh, um, militia people or QAnon people. Right, I thought you, I thought you said militias during that time you were filming. Um. I'm sure we saw. I'm sure I saw some cute. Oh, we there was a uh, one of uh, one, somebody did a someone did a presentation on what QAnon was um, at the at a Tea Party meeting that we that that I attended there. Uh, although it wasn't flooded with like Q you know paraphernalia that you see at, uh, that you saw at the Capitol, the riot at the Capitol, or anything. Um, but I'm sure that. Uh, I'm sure that there there were people in the ranks there that believed in 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 the Q conspiracy. Um, as far as militias go, I mean, you know, a Tea Party meeting. There's a lot of people who have guns on their hips. 
And, yeah. uh, you know, coming from New York City, uh, my initial impression was that everybody with a gun on their hips is a part of militia, but uh, that's not, that's not, the <laughs> <truth>. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's not the truth. I learned pretty quickly. Um, but I, like people in fatigues and things and dressed like play army people, oh, we didn't see any, we didn't see any of those there. Yeah. Has I, I was very afraid of going to the Tea Party meeting. I sat in the parking lot because I was really worried about how I would be perceived and I was also worried that we will never get access if I was, if I would go and <laughs> try and find access. But I, I think a lot of my trepidation was, I, f I feel like uh, a lot of it was not, it was exaggerated in my own mind. Some of it was true, but some of it was not. I think I was more afraid than the reality. Uh, somebody asked, has there been any further outreach between the left and right communities subsequently? Or was it mainly through your being there filming and you being the bridges? Um, I know that Tom and Greg have uh, spoken since. How meaningful, the, how meaningful the interaction was, I don't know. Um, they, you know, is it, it's it was it's a tough it's a tough time right now. Um, it's a tough time right now to get any kind of meaningful. Uh, there's there's very little in, there's very little reward in, by way of public opinion or otherwise for for politicians to cross the aisle at this point. I mean, yeah. Um, yeah. You see what's happening now to the ten to the ten Republicans who voted in the House to to impeach. Um, people are coming swift. Uh, swiftly and 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 powerfully for them in their next in their next next election, and so uh, if we can't if if that if if that impeachment vote uh, means that they they will not stick out their necks anymore, I mean if that's where we are, it's it's even harder for for people uh, like Tom and Greg to to get out there. Um, but that's not to say it's also also a product of COVID. I mean, there's been no speaking engagements. People yeah. people aren't going to church in person, um, and so I don't think that that means that that there there won't be, um, because we plan on we plan on trying to get uh, some screenings in the area once once vaccinations are are, um, are a little more ubiquitous. We plan on trying to screen the film there and have conversations with me, Hamel, Tom, and Greg, all together. So we hope that this film can be a little bit of the that catalyst that we uh, that we need to get them in one place and get people talking. Uh, but to date, there hasn't been there hasn't been a ton. That's really exciting. The idea that the two sides, with their father followers, will see these conversations between them in that booth, and see them coming together on certain issues. That could uh, that could be a, another film. I'd love. Agreed. Agreed. I'd, I'd love to be able to. Well, I. I guess if you're doing it post COVID, there's no way to zoom into the screening and the Q and A. Who, know, who knows? Maybe Zoom will be here to stay. Well, Heather and I were talking about that today and thinking it's been so wonderful. I mean, it's been a real challenge to go from having in-person filming and in-person discussions. On the other hand, um, we've been able to have people from like my cousin and his friend here, Matthew Gerson and Jeff. Weiss class are um, here from Chicago. That they wouldn't come yeah. from Chicago to Northampton to see a film. Right. So I've been thinking the best of both would be uh, for these kinds of social, well, for everything, weddings, bar mitzvahs, but <laughs> to be able yeah. to have a hybrid where people could zoom in. You yeah. know, I don't know if you've been thinking about that, but it could be really bring people together and hear thoughts from other parts of the country. That's true. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it takes much of a, I mean, we all kind of have been forced to learn the tech and I think that was the biggest, that was the biggest uh, impetus to, to, yeah. to doing this anyway. So now that everybody knows the tech, I think, I think that if, I think that Zoom will, will be here to stay to some degree. Yeah, I think these are some of the changes that are gonna be forever. I mean, they're here to stay. Well, besides screening back in the community, 
which I wish somebody would film the discussions. Yes. Um, besides that, and that's my dream. Uh, what are you? What are your next projects? Oh, our individual projects. Um, I am currently editing a series about uh, criminal justice reform in Philadelphia. Oh, and it's following the series is following a very progressive DA of Philly uh, called Larry Krasner and how he his regime. I mean, he's like, uh, you know, he's an anomaly in uh, among the DAs and how he has caused stir in the community and how some of his uh, measures are good and some of his measures could be perceived as too too naive so that it's a very interesting series which actually introduced me to criminal justice reform the fundamental problems in criminal justice system here which I wasn't aware of you know frankly I wasn't aware of even when we were making battleground you know Jonah and I used to fight very uh, passionately about you know, Jonah used to be, Jonah is like, Himal, you don't understand this. And I just couldn't understand it because I'm not a, I, I was not born and raised here. So I did not understand it. And uh, it's only through this documentary series that I've been able to understand the systemic racism in the criminal justice system. And I didn't, I didn't get that job for her also. Yeah, he didn't give me this job all by myself. <laughs> it had nothing yeah. to do with me. <laughs> uh -huh. No, but he, was, um, you know, I was very, like, when we were making this film, it was very surprising that I was drawn towards Tom Carroll because I, Tom Carroll reminded me of my own grandfather. I, I come from a very conservative Hindu Brahmin family in India, and my grandfather is a Hindu nationalist. And, you know, he's a very nice man. He's morally upright. He has strong ethical and moral values. And he's a loving member of the family and society, but he is, he is a Hindu nationalist and I can, I can understand it. And so when I started meeting Tom Carroll, I, I was like, I felt I was drawn to him because I, he reminded me of my grandfather. Whereas, I come from a socialist, I, you know, I grew up around socialism in India and I was very cautious of socialism. And so I wasn't attracted towards Greg, Greg Edwards. It was Jonah who drove me towards Greg, Greg Edwards. He's like, you do not understand this man. And it was Jonah who drove us. And it's very ironical, although I am colored yeah. and white, but still <laughs> that's how it was. That's fascinating. But that's why it's also, you know, that's why it was important for, for the both of us to have some, you know, kind of different belief systems going into this thing. Um, yeah. I, I don't, I, I certainly would not have made this film um, bipartisan or in the same way that she, that she pushed us to make this film. Um, mine would have been a, mine would have been a, a, a film all about Greg Edwards that ended in the primaries. And who knows if we'd all be sitting here talking about it. Um, so both of those pieces are, are were really important, and um, and the the film the film benefited from having both of those viewpoints on on it. Um, couldn't have been couldn't have been made without it. Um, and as far as work that I'm doing now, uh, I'm I, I'm working for the New York Times, often in New York City, and I'm working on a couple on developing a couple different projects. Uh, one is on COVID and response and the dis discrepancy in the response between uh, New York City and San Francisco um, and what it ultimately, ultimately meant for, for, its re for the residents here and there. Um, and then another one that's still too early in development to talk about, but uh, we'll have some things coming out relatively soon. Wow. I'm not getting more questions or, or maybe I am, let's see. Anybody else have anything they wanna discuss with the filmmakers? We have them for 10 more minutes if we like. I think yeah. the, I, I'm sorry. Yeah. Somebody speaking. I think Frank wants to speak. Frank. 
Uh, yes. Um, are, is is anyone? Are any of you still in touch with these two men? Yes, yes, we are. Oh uh, yes. Yeah. We, is there is there a specific question? Uh, we were just wondering how. Um, is there a follow up? Do you guys are you in touch with Greg and Tom? That's all. Yes, we are in touch with Greg and Tom, and we are hoping that we have, you know, discussions in Lehigh Valley and elsewhere where both Greg and Tom participate uh, to, you know, to share their point of views. And what I'm wondering too, obviously you have to have the two men be willing to talk to each other. But of course the big deal is whether that can multiply to four and four and so forth and so on. Have either of you seen that occur anywhere during the last four years? I don't know what other areas you've been connected to, but that's that's what I'm looking for forever, is where are dialogues possibly being nurtured and done? Or is it all you know behind the scene? I don't know. Well, I mean, first of all, I think it all comes down to us, right? I mean, who, you know, all of us in this room have friends or family that are that are Trump supporters or or that are Bernie or Biden supporters. And so, you know, I mean, how many people are in here are in this room right now? 20 something people multiply that times four, and we'll get started, you know, um, and that's what that's what this film was all about, was yeah. trying to have these two people who seemingly were so dug in in their ways if they can have that conversation, uh, then at least we can also have that conversation to some degree. Um, and so it starts with us. I mean, you know, everybody can stand around watching and waiting for two other people to start it. But but at the end, you know, if we don't take that first step, then nobody starts. Um, and I mean, I have a I have an aunt who is a, who is a Trump supporter, and we've had we've had a couple of conversations about it over over the past few years. And you know, some of the some have there's moments of uncomfortable, uh, but that's but we need to push through that, and that's that's the whole point. If it's if it's comfortable, then we're not really progressing, and we're not moving somewhere. Exactly. If you're talking to your neighbor and who feels the same way about something, and you know, and you're both just in agreement the whole time, then it's not a really it's not a challenging conversation per se. I I can add a quick note about this. Um, uh, I, I'm on a board of an of a organization called Convergence that does bridge building at, at a policy yeah. level. Um, but all at the sort of national level and even more grassroots, uh, there are lots of organizations out there. And I recommend taking a look at Braver Angels, um, okay. which is a really important organization. And then more broadly, there's an organization called the Bridge Alliance. That's a membership organization of over 100 organizations doing bridge building work of different types. Okay. That's amazing. So I think, Jeff, maybe it's possible to connect with us outside of this, because I think this film, there, there may be some synergy in what they're trying to do and what we've done in the film. Uh, I'm happy. I'm happy to connect. I'll, I'll, um, uh, I'll just, um, well, Kai. I, I, yeah, I have your um, email address so we can connect. Yeah. That way. Great. Okay. Thanks, so, well, following up on that, somebody just asked who came late. How did you get these two guys to talk to each other in the first place? Did they already know each other or were you, the, you know, how did you get them to talk to each other? Well, we always hoped that this would happen and we didn't know how it would happen. And somehow magically, I think when uh, Tom Carroll was running for his DA, his path crossed with Greg Edwards and, you know, and we had been mentioning to, we had been talking to Tom Carroll about Greg Edwards and to Greg Edwards about Tom Carroll. So they both kind of knew off of each other through us and then they, they started talking on their own. And uh, then we just got them together in a room, but it just happened. It was pure coincidence. Yeah, and excuse me. And Tom Carroll's DA race for to become district attorney of Northampton County, he was he was invited to a criminal justice reform um, uh, meeting at a state prison. Yeah. Uh, and and Greg was also there. So criminal justice reform was the thing that put the two of them in the same room. Um, yeah. Well, I, did you say you were gonna wait until 
COVID was over to have the screenings and bring people together? Uh, we... Or are you gonna just start going to the area and doing it like this? I mean, we're, we're, we're basically trying to figure that out now. Marga is come on recently to do some impact producing work and help help get this film out there. And so we're talking about the possibilities with her. Um, but we are, uh, we are available online. We're on Twitter. We have a website. Um, and, and so I invite people to, to sort of follow those things. Um, and, and, uh, and we can, I'll put in some of the links in the, in the chat so that people can see those, um, and, and follow along. And when we, when we have an update, we will, we will let everybody know. Oh, that's wonderful. Cause it, Certainly, I do think the film is a tool. Yeah. yeah. And I think I think both Jonah and I, because we are truly like we come, we do not belong to any big media house. We both were like, we both went out of our pure curiosity. Neither of us are activists. Neither of us are, you know, social workers or not social. We, neither of us are in, have any political agenda. We just went, it was a wide-eyed investigation. And I feel that is the reason why we could make a nonpartisan film if, and that probably is the platform that we get, we should have in order to have future conversations is a platform which does not have any political agenda because if there is a political agenda and if there's some power, then it just will start become, like feel like power yeah. just becomes, attracts corruption, you know, like, like sugar attracts ants. That's just the way it is. So I think you did a beautiful job. And um, I feel very lucky that Marga told us about the film. And I would love to see future work of yours and show it. And I'm interested in your, so keep, keep me informed and I'll yes. bring your stuff to the community. Thank you so much. Sure thing. I'm putting the. Uh, I'm going to put our the website for the film uh, in the chat right now. And if you search uh, "Battleground Film" on on social media, Instagram or Facebook, you'll be able to find our our page. Okay. So thank you so much for coming, and um, thank everybody for coming. And we'll... thank you, everybody. Appreciate okay, the you. thoughtful thank questions. You thank you. And and uh, it's the fourth Wednesday of every month. And right now, tentatively, the next film is going to be about student debt. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if anybody knows the filmmaker Astra Taylor. Anyway. No. Okay, well, good night. I'd love to stay in touch, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you.